Welcome, good afternoon. Thanks for showing up and we have with us, we're down to basic trio today. We have Dean Camille Nelson of the William S. Richardson School of Law, University of Hawaii, former Dean at Washington University, or Washington School of Law at American University and at Suffolk in Boston. And Bill Harrison, one of our senior criminal defense attorneys and long well-versed both of these scholars in civil rights areas. So my self all startup question for today is, now that we're 26 days from the election, what makes this one different? What's unique and different about this election and the season? I'll let you start off, Camille. Oh, so is, is it 26 days? Who's counting? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so I, I think there's always an elevated level of, of debate and discourse uh, leading up to elections, but this go round it seems particularly polarized. And um, you know the debates yesterday were more more civil, but still I think you know there's been a um, I, I bemoan anyway the sort of lack of civility um, at, over the course of you know how we've engaged along political and ideological lines. I think that is important for us as a democracy. I think this election there is so much at stake. And I think maybe that's why there's an elevated, uh, frankly, lack of civility or polarization. I think, you know, certainly the, the uh, concerns around the, the Supreme Court, uh, criminal legal system, healthcare, education, immigration. I mean, there are so many um, intersecting uh, and really important areas of our, of our democracy that seem to be, the, let alone the environment and climate justice, right? I mean, our, the, our world. So there seems to be an urgency um, that seems palpable. Those are, those are my few thoughts for now. I look forward to hearing what my friend thinks. Similarly, I, I also agree with you. Um, you know, we're, we're having these debates and, and hopefully, um, well, I, I kinda, I'm gonna back up a little bit. I was gonna say, hopefully our um, young people are watching these debates, but um, I, I back up a little bit because, uh, you know, as growing up, as you remember watching debates, you, you saw, as Camille talked about the civility of the debates and, and people actually following rules and regulations and no name calling and, um, you know, the, the grace and, and uh, the respect that uh, was shown generally on these kinds of, um, uh, of campaign, um, you know, debates. And that is just... Uh, you know, gone uh, way down, and and uh, you know there is just infighting and his name calling and everything else, and and you wonder how this is affecting our young people who are watching these, uh, you know, these leaders, our leaders, uh, you know, debate about uh, important, you know, national and world problems, uh, and and you wonder if the message coming across to them um, is feeding into what's going on in the world today. And, and so that's my concern. This is a strange time for us, uh, not only through the politics of it, but because of the world events surrounding uh, the politics of it and the things that we're going through with this pandemic and, and other issues in the world. So, you know, I, I'm um, very, you know, uh, I guess the best way to, to put it, I'm, I'm, I'm very um, concerned as, as <laughs> and that's a nice word to, to put it, concerned about these uh, these debates and 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 really how they portray our leaders not only to the young people of this country uh, but the world in, in general I, I'm just wondering what the world's thinking about these folks seeing these debates hey, well as a friend put it he said you know hey when you have a, a vice presidential political debate in which the only calm cool and collected and composed party is an insect you know that you have a <laughs> I knew the fly was going to get in there sometime. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's too easy. Hopefully, all of the late night commentators have exhausted all the fly jokes and uh, Lord of the Flies and the need for Babe Ruth to come in and help out as the Sultan of SWAT or something like that. <laughs> but but there's a serious aspect to that. My question is, what do you think people who do watch those debates who, who really want to find out something, I mean, not just see their person win or lose or whatever. What do you think they want to see, want to hear, want to get? Well, you know, from my perspective, as I, I believe most people's perspectives are, you want to find out where the candidate stands, okay? 
And one of the things you want from your candidate is the truth. That's that's most important because you're gonna you're gonna make a decision or you know select a candidate based on that candidate's views and that those views more closely relate to what you stand for. And the problem with these debates is that we don't know what they stand for really. Um, at the conclusion of the debates, you ask yourself, you know, I thought I heard that person tell me something differently before. Um, I thought that person's stand was. Um, you know, as to this matter this way, and I'm getting a different uh, idea and, and, a, and a, you know, an opinion and a stand at this point in time. And so are they catering to what they think we want to hear? You know, they want, you know, we want as, as the, uh, the voters to hear. And, and if that's the case, then, you know, it really, it really troubles me that they, they take that position in responding to my questions. But really, I think we all want to, to know the truth. Where do you stand truthfully? On, on certain issues and what will you do uh, when you take office? And I've come away with the decision that, or the belief that I don't know what anyone will do uh, in, in this situation. So what do I do? Do I go and, and decide this based on um, the closest uh, moral and ethical and, and, and principled person that I could uh, glean from these, these individuals, uh, people closest to me and, and what I think they they stand for or do I go with what they tell me they stand for you know that's that's the difficult question I have I mean okay. I I agree that the content and the substance of what's being shared along sort of ideological lines with respect to certain areas of our society so where do they stand on healthcare? where do they stand on education all of that is crucial where do they stand on you know the racial reckoning that we're experiencing absolutely important and primary I also think there is, I, at least speaking for myself and, you know, um, maybe a few others, you know, you're looking at how they demonstrate leadership, um, thoughtfulness, some level of a contemplation, um, I, I, dignity, uh, respect, some diplomacy. I mean, I, 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 I hope I'm not sounding old fashioned in having some expectations in terms of how one walks through this world as demonstrative of a, a sort of higher calling if one is going to be, you know, the leader of this country or leaders of this country. So the world is watching. And I do think, you know, having a representative of this country also on the world stage bespeaks content and character. And, you know, I think people are judging both. Exactly. I, I totally agree with you, Camille. You know, and that's a really interesting point to bring up because just over a week ago, the former governor of Montana, former head of the Republican National Committee, eh, came out and publicly said, I'm not going to vote for Trump. I can't vote for Trump. Eh, and that means I'm going to vote for Biden. I don't agree with a good bit of his stuff, and I'm sure there are going to be discussions and differences, but ultimately it comes down to the character of the person. Hey, and I think that's part of what I'm hearing. But, uh, let me ask another question. I'm, I mediate for a living, have done that now for 35 years. So managing conversations to promote civil dialogue, to build respect and understanding, hopefully mutually, is, is critical to effective communications in my experience. Um, have we seen that from the conversation managers in these two debates? You wanna tackle that first, Camille, and I'll jump in. Or... Are you speaking specifically, Chuck, about the moderators? Or are you speaking about the, no. yeah. You I know, I, you know I, I think they have a really hard job <laughs> No and question. so I don't want to be, you know, perceived as being overly critical. I think, you know, if you go back to sort of like debate 101 and what we impress upon as an educator, I return to what do we try to impress upon students on debate club and such. I think, you know, there are ways in which one might, you know, at the end of the day say, well, did they or didn't they? Um, but I also think the participants in any engagement like that, whether it's a, a sporting event or a debate or some other type of, you know, lab or something also have to understand the rules of the of the road as they were and agree to abide by them um, to, to, to get your points as you will. So I think it takes it in this 
case, it takes more than one actor too. And, you know, when they come to your, to your space and you're mediating, presumably you've laid out the rules and you expect them to, to abide by that. And, you know, and um, hopefully they buy into that as part of their desire to mediate. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a sort of rule adherence question uh, more generally. Yeah, and that's, I think that's a really good point because at the beginning of every mediation I do, we have a short joint session sure. where we go over the ground rules. And as the moderator of the conversation, I go over those to make sure everybody understands them. But I also let them know what measures may be invoked in order to adhere to those and to enforce those. And I'm almost wondering, as a media, I don't know if it could have effectively been done with the president that he is who he is. <laughs> but at least when you lay that out in the beginning, these are the ground rules that we're going to enforce those. And this is what we're going to do to enforce those, even if it means cutting off mics or things like that. Because I think the most frequent comment I saw after the debate from people was, turn off this mic already <laughs> for both debates. Yeah, and you know, you, you really feel sorry uh, for these moderators and, um, you know, they, they try to rein in the participants, uh, you know, much like a, a referee, I guess, um, and they don't listen. And so you have to start taking a, a hard line position and, and it's really difficult because you don't want to be the person that the public says, hey, you know, why are you getting that way or why are you being so aggressive or why are you, you taking that position? But as you say, at, at some point, you have to say, OK, we're going to turn off your mic if you choose not to follow the rules. And you know that both parties knew the rules going in. Uh, I'm sure they were told several times and, and their, their, their people, their handlers were told this is the way this uh, debate's going to go. Yet uh, they chose to, to take over and ignore um, the moderator in, in, in this instance. So I would have totally cut them off uh, and made it clear that they were not going to get the microphone and they can continue to talk without any sound, but I would go to the other party at that point and say, you know, you have your two minutes or what have you. You know, the other question that comes up, I, I read a short article by a very experienced speech pathologist who said, if you look at what the president did in that debate, uh, the yelling, the interrupting, the bullying, the lying, the threatening. He said, if you pick six or seven triggers to try and trigger stuttering in someone who is subject mm -hmm. to that, those would be at the top of the list. Interesting. So tested, maybe it's not entirely an accident. Maybe it's not just who he is. Um, it doesn't seem to have been very successful in the sense of you know, breaking down Vice President Biden's ability to be able to get words out, but as a strategy, it adds another dimension to this. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah. it goes back, Dean, to your point. We expect a kind of conduct. And I'll ask you folks, is it old fashioned to believe in and expect our leaders to exemplify the beliefs and values that we have been raised with and most honor? You know, I'll, I'll be candid in saying that I think it's a question that is sort of, we're seeing in multiple areas, even outside of the political discourse. And I, I don't want to yearn for the old days when they were frankly less equitable and, and go back to some sort of bygone era where like women and people of color were disenfranchised and we had, you know, no same sex marriage. Like I don't yearn for some, some sense of a bygone era that was good for everybody because I don't think it was. But I do think we should speak seriously about expectations of leaders in, 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 all, in leadership generally um, as modeling a type of engagement around difficult questions and difficult conversations. And I think sometimes that's really hard for people and it's really easy to just sort of cancel and quit people. And, you know, and I think that's a real 
lost opportunity. One, I think there are teaching moments in there and I have, I, I do believe that in my heart, but as an educator, I, I think that's right. But I also think, I mean, God, if we can't, if we can't talk to each other, I, I mean, I don't know what hope there is for a, a sort of coalition building or consensus building or allyship or actually changing people's minds if there's even that possibility anymore. But I, I, I would hope that we could at least a, agree to disagree a lot better than we seem capable of in some spaces right now. And it doesn't have to be personal, right? I mean, we could disagree on the on the, the questions before us without descending into some vile pit of like personal attacking, you know, and attacking each other and each other's families or each other's backgrounds. I mean, I just think at that point, there's very little good that can come of that, but maybe that's not the aspiration is for good to come of it. Because I think that's when people shut down and become defensive and, and, and it's hard to make any progress. Yeah, and I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Great, Charles. No, I just wanted to thank you for getting those values. And we have a recent very vivid example of that in the late Justice Ginsburg and the late Justice Scalia. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I, I, I truly agree. Um, you know, civility and respect, uh, then that's not old fashioned. Um, that, that is the, the baseline that we should be operating on in our life um, generally and everything that we do. We should always be civil. Uh, we should always show respect. I think those, uh, and people you know, may suggest that those are old fashioned. I don't think so. I really don't. I, I just think that that's what makes a society and, a, and a, you know, um, uh, a correct, balanced uh, society, that civility and, and respect. And not only do those connect us, but let me throw another question out, uh, taking two really important elements that uh, Camille brought up. And it's, that is the behaviors that honor those traditional values, the dignity, the respect, and the expectation and the desire that the communications and conduct especially of our leaders, will reflect those beliefs and values. Uh, what role does that play in this culture of inequality that has been unfortunately growing pervasively and dangerously and destructively in this country? Is there a connection? I, I totally see a connection uh, in this respect, okay? Um, and I say respect, and that's the, that's the key uh, here, is that we as, as an individual should respect one another. Um, I think, and you don't have to come from a, a background of Christianity, you can come from any background, any religion, but you will note um, clearly that, and, and the Christian um, you know, ethos is that um, you are to uh, treat uh, your neighbor as you would treat yourself. I mean, that's that's a basic premise, uh, a biblical premise and, and, and a Christian premise. And I think that that is pervasive through uh, any kind of religion is that uh, you want to treat another, another individual much like you'd want to treat um, yourself or be treated, uh, you know, from someone else. So clearly, when we talk about um, this term, uh, uh, respect is, is right there at the top of the list. Uh, and if we cannot respect one another, I think that's a, really a root of all uh, of these problems that we have with, um, with the ego, um, you know, with discrimination. Um, it's, it's a belief that we are somehow above um, someone else, some group of people, you know, um, some beliefs, and we don't have to adhere to those beliefs. And I think that's really my belief that that's the problem that, that, that really uh, is germane to um, discrimination, you know, racial strife, um, you know, the, the things that we're talking about, the conversations we're having now. Yeah, I think those are great points. And, you know, can I just, I'll add a, just a yeah, quick, quick point. You know, when I was growing up, the talk around sort of back home, we used to say, um, you know, um, not so much the melting pot, but the mosaic, the, the, in, growing up in Canada, the cultural mosaic, right? And um, multiculturalism, but the language was often centered around tolerance. And I don't think that's the right way to think about it as opposed to respect and appreciation, exactly. because to me, sort of, if you're tolerating something, you're sort of putting up with an irritation or you're putting up with something. It's not like an embrace, right? It's not an appreciation and a, a sort of um, willingness to maybe even get to affection for someone who you think is not like you. And I think 
you know, part of your, your question, Chuck, I don't want to sort of buy into the notion of sort of respectability politics, like, because I think there's an implication around sort of assimilationism. and we have to all look and dress and act a certain way. And there's only one sort of normative way to be appropriate. But I do think it's upon us if we really care about diversity, inclusion and access and empowerment to sort of listen across perceived difference, right? Like listen across accent, right? Understand across background and sort of, you know, be willing to spend the time and the energy to learn. And I always keep, you know, I say, listen to learn, not listen to respond to each other, right? And that requires the, the person who is trying to learn from another to have some patience, but also to have some willingness to understand that we, we, don't all have to be alike to appreciate each other and to work well together, right? We don't all have to put on the same uniform or dress, act, look, come from the same place to be able to do something powerful and positive together. But it takes, exactly. sometimes it takes work. No, and I absolutely think it's critically important. Uh, now we know why you're the dean and the teacher and we're the student. <laughs> exactly. You not only anticipated my question, you anticipated the whole direction of it. <laughs> And that is that the way that people are treated is an element of that discrimination, of that inequality. Mm -hmm. And the people who have been subjected, subjected to the treatment without those values of dignity, respect, understanding, have been identifiable, marginalized categories and continue. Right. To. And if That's anything, who we may be farther backward on that track than we were. What's your sense of that, Bill? I'm where sorry, did you ask me? Yeah, where yes, are okay. we on the spectrum? Okay, you know, I, it, this, is, this is an interesting um, discussion because I just finished a, a conversation, um, a virtual um, conference with regard to implicit bias. And, and this is really what uh, was discussed throughout this whole conference is this implicit bias. And we had um, panelists who were from, these were uh, defense attorneys from all over the country and um, uh, different races um, from um, Native American to Asian, um, to uh, black, to, to uh, white. And, and the, the main focus of the uh, discussion with regard to implicit bias is that understanding that we have seen things and we put people in categories and we don't really understand a lot of times, we don't even believe that we are putting people in categories. And, and a lot of it has to do with the inequality has gone on um, and has become you know, systemic that we don't even understand that we're seeing these uh, individuals in um, certain roles. And, and we can so get used to it that when we see them outside of those roles, we cannot um, see them uh, as that person we talk about is, as Camille says, we talk about how we don't want everyone to be um, all, um, you know, dressing the same way. Um, you know, we don't want that homogenization, you know, thought process to be there. Uh, unfortunately, it goes on and we're not aware of it. And unfortunately, that then translates in how we treat people. And uh, a lot of us have even, you know, there, there is these... Um, Kind of tests you can take out there. I think Harvard has a test, and, and basically that determines your 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 um, sensitivity with regard to implicit bias. And 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 when you take those tests, you know most people will say, I have don't have a bias bone in my body. I don't have a prejudicial bone in my body. And they take that test and they're shocked. Okay, because again, we as we grow up, um, we get enculturated with certain concepts, and we don't even know we're enculturated with those concepts until it really happens. So. And so uh, getting back, I've kind of sort of digressed a little bit from your, your question there, but getting back to that, th that's really the concern here is um, how do we get people to realize that this is going on and uh, how do we address that? That's really the, the, the real conversation that we should be having here and, um, and, and being able to sensitize ourselves to this problem first and foremost and to educate and discuss this, this concept uh, so that people can grasp it, get a hold of it. And, and so that, that's really, I think, where we need to go first to get to the, the bigger question. That's the heart of the matter of observation. And, and I'd like to go back, Camille, to your point. How do we, and extrapolate from Bill, how do we get people to value diversity itself? So, you know, I, I would start with the 
self-awareness part. And I think, you know, hopefully people appreciate that with diversity and inclusion come benefits. And I think there is, you know, for people who actually study this, there are benefits to decision making, benefits to having inclu inclusive leadership structures in terms of outcomes, output, ret recruitment, retention, right? So I think there is an abundant literature, um, it's social science literature, and employment literature, and in, in, in a number of spaces that talk about the, the, the enhanced value and the decreased liability and other things in terms of costs, um, let alone the sort of what I would say is this, the doing the right thing. But I think if someone is interested in making a difference in these ways, it has to start with a sort of what, you know, Bill was saying around what is one's participation in making the situation or the circumstance better. And I think there are those implicit bias tests, but I also think when you sort of look around how we walk through this world and how we engage in our, in our, work environments in our school environments in our in our worship lives in our personal lives like what does our what does our what does our circle look like i mean who's in it and who's not and why like i mean some places you have to work pretty hard to have a like a homogenous right you know and then yeah. so like how does that happen right you know and you know and, and so i think that sort of self-interrogation um is important as a starting point for transformation. Because I think if the starting point is I'm okay, I don't have any work to do, it's everybody else, we're not gonna get to where we, we need to go. I think all of us have implicit biases, all of us have work to do along multiple identity, uh, you know, quote unquote vectors and intersectional spaces. And if, if I sort of go, well, I'm opting out because I see myself in this way, like, I mean, I think we're, I think that's, that's unfortunate and will lead to us not doing uh, the good work and the po having the positive outcomes that we could have. So it takes all of us. Like, I mean, that takes a village as I think an understatement, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And a salad bowl village. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have one of the leading experts anywhere on that, Josh Levinson, right up at Richardson School of Law. And maybe you can help us lure him down for the next Justin, time. yes. Uh, Professor Justin Levinson Justin. is exceptional Justin, and he's right. written a lot in this space. And yeah, I think he would be a, a valuable, valuable expert to speak with about this. Okay. So hey, as we go into our last minute, we'll try and persuade Justin to come join <laughs> us. <laughs> Any last thoughts? Camille? You know, I think it's it's important that, you know, we're having these conversations. And I just want to thank you for including me. I think this is part of the work is engaging in these conversations in ways that we're brainstorming together um, with hopefully, you know, us all going forward and trying to sort of interrogate ourselves and to, and to think about how we can do better. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And, and this, this, these kinds of conversations not only stimulate um, discussions amongst one another, but it, it, it stimulates um, introspection. We look at ourselves and say, hey, you know, I got to start thinking about my role in, in this in this uh, conversation and in, in this problem. And, and every one of us uh, are part of the problem, uh, so to speak. And so once we learn that, we understand that uh, we, you know, we, we take it and own it. I think the the conversation will start working uh, and we'll start getting to where we want to be. Fantastic. I want to thank both of you. This has been fantastic. If there were one word that I would apply to what you both bring to the table, it would be illuminating. And on that note, thank you. May the come the light shine for us on into November and so we can breathe in January. Beautiful. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. all Good best. to see you folks. Okay. Take care.